Our speaker today is a friend of mine. I've known him a long time. We're from the same neck of the woods. Uh, Merle Temple is um, a native of Tupelo, Mississippi, it says here in the book. And he came of age in the South in the wake of Elvis. I'm reading from the dust jacket. The Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War. After high school, he worked for the FBI in Washington before returning to Mississippi to earn two degrees at Ole Miss. As one of the first new centurions, he signed on with a new agency, the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics. A Ghostly Shade of Pale is fiction based on his experiences with the MBN and Merle lives near Tupelo with his wife, Judy, who is now on the road with him as he travels with this book that has been highly successful. Uh, please give Merle a warm uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark Carl. Uh, you notice she didn't say how, how old her friends we were and how long we've known each other. And I appreciate that. Uh, uh, but I met so many people uh, on these book tours uh, that I hadn't, some of them I hadn't seen in, in gosh, 40 uh, years or more. And uh, that's been one of the true blessings uh, of this journey that Judy and I have been on is to meet so many people from so long ago. and. Uh, be given a second chance uh, to say uh, two things uh, to people, either uh, thank you or I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and, and people never remember what you're thanking them for or what you're sorry for. <laughs> and I say that doesn't matter, I do, and uh, I remember something from long ago where I should have uh, said thank you uh, to you or said it in a better way. And, and or just uh, said I'm sorry and explained some things to you maybe that circumstances didn't permit me to do. But uh, this has been quite a journey. We uh, kicked off our, our, our book tour uh, at Reed's Gum Tree Store. And uh, I'll tell you all that I had, uh, when I wrote this book, began to write it, uh, I included a line in there about Michael when he leaves Ole Miss and he, uh, uh, he went down uh, when he graduated uh, to get a suit he still really couldn't afford down at Reed's store in Tupelo and I waited for two years to see if Mr. Reed would notice that and say something to me about it and he did. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was, I waited a long time to see if Mr. Reed would do that because I had tremendous respect for Mr. Reed and, and to me, to me, growing up in Tupelo, I mean, Reeds is just, uh, it's an iconic uh, establishment here, and uh, how can you talk about uh, Tupelo without mentioning Reeds? And some people asked me when I first did the first draft of this book, they asked me, well, because uh, they're younger, and they said, well, why do you insist on having uh, this Elvis thread that runs through the book, too? And I said, well, I said, uh, how can you talk about old Tupelo in Memphis in the 70s w when this book is set? without talking about Elvis, uh, his backdrop and flavor and, and everything. And I said, besides that, I said, I just want to. <laughs> and they said, well, okay. And, uh, and I said, I don't think uh, some of the younger folks, uh, I don't think they know some of the, uh, uh, the music and the song lyrics that I reference in this book. And I said, well, that's okay. It's not important that you do. I said, there are a lot of people who do. And I said, besides that, it is a, a flavor and backdrop that s sets the times. And, and I said, if we think long term, if we're successful and Hollywood does pick this book up, we already have our soundtrack laid down. <laughs> and so, but we, uh, Judy and I are just back from Hollywood. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, last, uh, last summer, uh, I knew someone who knew Jim Clemente at uh, Criminal Minds, which has been going in their ninth year on uh, CBS now. And uh, so I, uh, I wrote Jim, and I said, Jim, I said, I've, I've written this uh, book. And I said, I wonder if you'd read it for me and tell me if it's any good or if I should do, do humankind a favor and destroy all copies of it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he said, sure. He said, uh, I will take a look at it. He said, we're in production now and, and doing some specials for biography and history and so forth, and uh, it may take a while. So months and months and months. I went by, and, and uh, Judy can attest, uh, patience is not one of my virtues. And, uh, and I was dying to get on my keyboard. It's like uh, Peter Sellers and Dr. Strangelove, anybody who remembers that, couldn't stop his hand. And, 
and I was uh, wanting to get on those keyboards and start typing, you know, and say, uh, have you read it, have you read it, have you read it, did you like it, did you like it, did you like it? And I knew that was the wrong thing to do, so I waited and I waited, and finally months went by and uh, it popped up in my inbox, and it was from Jim, and he said, I'm sorry it took so long to get back to you. He said, I'm not quite finished. He said, but I just wanted to stop and tell you, he said, you're not only a great writer, you're a great writer of American literature, because that's what this is, a big crime story is literature. And uh, so at, at that moment at the computer, I turned and yelled, Judy, you won't believe it. <laughs> and and uh, so Judy came running, and we talked, and we waited, and he came back, and he said, I'm, he said, it's big and it's complex. He said, but the right screenwriter can adapt it. And he said, I want to represent you and help you in Hollywood. And so from that point, it just took off. And um, uh, so he, uh, he started telling everybody about it and asking for books to give to people and let them read it, uh, some of the uh, shakers and movers out there. And uh, by the time we got to Hollywood, uh, Jim, in his way, I think it, he had built me up so much, I think everybody was a little disappointed when they actually met me. They thought maybe I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof or something, but uh, uh, but Jim is a, just a great guy, and uh, so finally got to actually meet him face to face. We've become such great friends. Just proud to know him. Um, he was with the FBI uh, before he made it big in Hollywood, and he was a first responder at Ground Zero at 9-11 risked everything and like so many of the first responders uh, didn't have the proper filters and the breathing equipment uh, Jim got cancer uh, and had to have a bone marrow transplant and while he was recovering Manny Potemkin who used to be on ER and was on Criminal Minds in the early days he came to talk to the FBI because they were thinking about making Criminal Minds based on the special crimes unit that Jim was in and Jim has a real heart, especially for young people, for children that are abused and abducted and, and so forth. But, he, but Manny shows up and he talked to everybody and he was not, not satisfied. And he said, doesn't anybody at the FBI have any personality? And they said, well, they said, Clemente does, but he's homesick. And so Manny calls him and said, I'm coming over to your apartment. And uh, he said, you can, I'm in isolation from the bone marrow transplant. He said, but I can put on my mask and gloves and meet you at Starbucks. So he did, and Manny walks in, he said, hello, I'm Manny Potemkin, and Jim said, well, sure you are. <laughs> <laughs> and so that started it all. He, he, he became their advisor on how to set it all up and, uh, and really did a smart thing. He didn't charge him anything. And uh, so uh, they approached him, he retired, early uh, from the FBI and uh, went to Hollywood and it's just uh, made it big out there. He's their technical advisor and their writer uh, now on, uh, and they really, they run everything by him when it comes to is it real, is it, is it actual, uh, something actually something that would happen in, in real life. And he's got his fingers in many pies and he's just, uh, just, been, uh, just been so kind to us. And I told him that the quote on the front and the back of the book, I said, uh, I tell everybody, I said, uh, when I quote him, I said, I guess y'all can tell I've uh, quoted Jim Cometti so many times now I can do it in my sleep, you know, that, uh, about me being a great storyteller and, uh, you know, that's beautifully sinister and detailed and complex and all that. And, and uh, so he, he introduced us to so many people when we were in Hollywood. He brought us to the set of Criminal Minds and uh, we just had a blast. Uh, they've kind of adopted us. and. Uh, and uh, we watched the filming of an episode there. They showed us all how it worked, and they're a well-oiled machine. I'm telling you, they, they, as soon as they leave one room in the set, the crew's right behind them, tearing it down and making it up for what it'll be by the time they rotate to come back around. And it may have been a sheriff's office in Louisiana an hour ago, and it may be a law office in Washington, D.C., you know, by the time they rotated back r around, but tracking them through the script. And uh, we met the cast and signed books and met Joe Mantegna, who I'd watched for years and all these mafia movies and everything. And, uh, and I told him, I said, Joe, I said, uh, you know, I said, Judy had never seen Godfather 3. I said, I just showed it to her, you know, where you got brutally murdered in the streets in New York for opposing Al Pacino, the Godfather. And he said, I've been brutally murdered many times inside and outside the movies. <laughs> And so they were just nice to you folks, you know, and went to the dressing room, and then we went over to uh, 
the set of major crimes, a spinoff with The Closer. And I met Tony Dennison, who I admired for years, and uh, G.W. Bailey used to be in MASH, played Rizzo, and we signed, went in their dressing rooms, talked about their families, and and Dennis Farina, who, who was in Crime Story with uh, Tony, who had just passed away that week, and uh, signed books, and they invited us to eat on the, eat on the set with them, and, and so we ate on the set uh, there with them. Uh, that night, and it was kind of, it was really quite surreal. It was all quite surreal, uh, all of that. And um, and I told him because uh, Tony played Ray Luca in the Crime Story, if y'all remember that from the '80s. Michael Mann, when he first burst on the scene, he had that gritty uh, Crime Story on TV uh, series, and he played and Tony played this classic gangster, you know, with the big hair and the suits and everything named Ray Luca. And we were, when we were going down the line there where they catered the food to the stars, I said, Tony, I said, back in the 1980s, I said, I don't think I would ever believe that uh, I would now be on the set uh, having uh, dinner with Ray Luca. <laughs> and, but they're just nice as they could be. And, uh, and we went on a, a TV show out there called uh, Media Mayhem and got the hardest questions I've ever been asked there. Those were deep, thoughtful questions. and. Uh, you know, when I went in there, I thought it might not necessarily be exactly a friendly place. And, uh, uh, but uh, the lady who was doing the interviewing, she uh, was just great to us. And she admitted that, she said, when I began this book, she said, uh, she said, I, I thought right away, she said, I had Michael all figured out. And by extension, me, because Michael is, is loosely based on, on my life. And she said, I thought he was this, I thought he was that, and then and, 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 and I said, then you discovered he wasn't one-dimensional. She said, that's it. And I said, so well, I, I said, no, he's not. And I said, I hope I, I was not one-dimensional. And, uh, and the young man who came up and mic'd me uh, right before we went live on, the, on taping of the show uh, looked very familiar, and it turns out he looked like his daddy. It was Mel Gibson's son. And I asked him, I said, well, how's your daddy? And he said, oh, he's doing good. And I said, well, let me autograph a book for him. And so we did, and uh, it just went like that. And we, had, uh, we were truly blessed because we had uh, uh, an hour of drive time uh, on KKLA, a huge radio station out there and the largest Christian radio station in the United States. And um, that, uh, that was an emotional, emotional hour. Uh, to talk about many things and faith and uh, being in the valley and uh, and uh, so many things and there were a lot of lump in the throat, tear in the eye moments uh, there and uh, a lot of hugs when we left and as I was leaving I turned and I said, y'all haven't seen the last of me and I said, that's not a threat. <laughs> and uh, but uh, Ann, Judy and I had the experience, uh, which everyone should have, of being stuck on uh, the L.A. freeway for two and a half hours <laughs> where people try to run over you and it was stop and go. And uh, so everybody should have that experience. Of, they call it The Five and The Fifteen out there. And uh, so right after our KKLA interview, we went to sign at the Lifeway store in Brea, California, a suburb of L.A. And uh, uh, the outpouring there was just tremendous. People had heard us on the radio. One lady came in the front door and said, I heard you on the radio. I want four books. And, uh, and we just people uh, came in, uh, talked with us, prayed with us, cried with us. It was really quite emotional. Uh, two cousins, my first cousins, I hadn't seen one in 33 years and one in over 50 years, came uh, to the signing. We all went out to, to dinner, and it was quite emotional. And, and we sold more books there than anybody ever had, at, except Charles Stanley. And I said, well, he's been on TV for 55 years, so, you know, it has a big uh, PR machine with him. And uh, so it was just, uh, uh, just a joy and a blessing. Got to go up to Malibu and sign some books. And, uh, and uh, some of y'all may have run into Allison Adams when she visited Tupelo. She's the daughter of Nick Adams, you know, the late actor. I know Johnny Yuma the Rebel and some of that, you know. And uh, she invited us up to Malibu for the signing, and we went, and then we had dinner with her right on the beach at the Sunset Restaurant as the sun was setting over the oceans and the cliffs all around us. It was, of course, me, I was always looking for Frankie and Annette. I, I knew they had to be up there somewhere, because <laughs> I used to, I grew up on those movies, especially at, at uh, Lee Drive-In, if any of y'all showing my age now. Yeah, Mr. Hurd would be proud if he were still here, and I mentioned Lee Drive-In. And, uh, 
Uh, so we had a, had a great time, and uh, it's, it's been quite an adventure. And uh, I went back to Las Vegas on the way back, uh, saw some friends in Vegas, and signed at Barnes & Noble. Sold more books at Barnes & Noble than, than any author ever had. And, and a lot of that's just uh, due to the fact uh, that I never meet a stranger. And most authors, uh, good writers, probably better writers than I am, uh, when they come in, they sit at their table very quietly and meekly, Mr. Reed, and uh, and uh, they don't engage anybody, and that's that's just not me. And uh, so I said, I guess I got that from my mother, from those of y'all I talked with who, who knew mother, because yeah, she never met a stranger. And uh, so, uh, uh, so and we have people who started following us on Facebook from all across the country and around the world. And uh, I got a note from a lady in Australia. He told me that she said your your villain in the book, you know, just scared the heck out of me. And uh, others said we had nightmares. And you know, and then one lady wrote me and she said I bawled. She said through three chapters. And uh, so all these things are so heartwarming to hear. And uh, I was just saying a minute ago that uh, uh, Private Academy who just told me that they've made ghostly required readings for their kids in the English classes, and they want us to come down. And that just humble. That's humbling. And a little frightening, I was telling Ms. McDuffie, I said, because to know that English teachers are really looking closely at my writing, you know, <laughs> and I wonder what, what, what errors they're going to find, you know, and uh, so, uh, but it's just, uh, it's just been uh, so humbling and, uh, and such, a, such a joy to do this. Uh, Ghostly is the first in a trilogy, uh, all uh, based, uh, loosely based on my life. And I'm, I've begun the uh, sequel now called A Rented World. And uh, Judy and I are going to uh, uh, Florida next month to rest, rewind, recharge, and to me to bear down on a rented world. There's a lot of people who've read Ghostly early on have been quite adamant they're re ready now for, for number two for the sequel. And I said, well, I've got to promote this one. But uh, all three, and tentatively the third book in the series will be entitled Redeemed. And uh, so, a lot to say between now and the end of the third book. Uh, but uh, Ghostly is written as fiction, but it's based on things that happened to me when I was fresh out of Ole Miss, and I always say, I emphasize the word fresh, naive, wet behind the ears, full of good intentions, but had no idea what we were getting into when we left Ole Miss, and President Nixon had just declared the first war on drugs. and. Uh, and so uh, he had created the new Drug Enforcement Administration. States were following suit, creating state agencies to mirror that. And, of course, Mississippi did, created the Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics. And uh, so I went there, first deep undercover. There weren't very many of us, so we were, we were often working solo. And uh, if you got in trouble, the cavalry wasn't coming because uh, there was no cavalry. And uh, so uh, a lot of things happened, uh, which are fictionalized in the book. I was kidnapped, uh, held hostage uh, in 1972 in uh, South Mississippi, uh, uh, taken to this little uh, shack uh, on, on the Mississippi-Louisiana border, uh, you know, a fog rising from the ground, moss hanging from the trees, the, the, you know, the spooky moon, you know, peeking out through the, through the clouds. and. Uh, uh, you know, a perfect setting for a B-horror movie. And everything that you'd ever experienced in your life, all those bump in the night moments, it all came rolling up at, at one time that night. And, uh, and uh, so I, I got to listen to them talk about what they were going to do with my body once they had killed me. And uh, one of them who was holding guns on me uh, that night, he... Uh, if all, those of y'all who remember the old double-edged Gillette razor blades we used to use back in the olden days, uh, he actually pulled one out, looking at me eye to eye, and uh, bit it in two, chewed on it, and swallowed it. And, uh, and blood uh, began to just uh, gush uh, from his mouth and throat. It bubbled up at the corners of his mouth and ran down on his throat. And at midnight, in that setting, uh, that was an eerie thing, and, and he he wiped a big fingers full of, out of his mouth and a asked me if I wanted some, and I told him I didn't believe I'd care for any. And, uh, and then he took a whole box of long stem kitchen matches and made the flame of the whole box at once, this huge flame, and and he was he was bowed over this with the blood gushing out of his mouth and running it out on his throat. 
and uh, and then he swallowed the flame of all that huge flame and it was then that I believed I was going to die and my whole life began to flash before my eyes and I saw images of myself as a toddler with mother and daddy things I could never consciously recall I was so small <clears throat> but they say that, uh, that when you die you believe you're going to die or about to your life flashes for your eyes and I can attest that's the truth and it was beautiful actually uh, terrible circumstances but it was beautiful to see all of that but um, as you can see, I, I made it through that, and I'll let, I'll, I won't go into that anymore. And then um, and I met two contract killers uh, near Horn, at the Horn Lake exit south of Memphis who lured me out to kill me. I had a contract to kill me because we had hit organized crime uh, south of Memphis. They didn't take kindly to that. And I talked to Gerald Chatham a, a while back, and Gerald was, he's a judge now. He was a DA back then. And... Uh, and uh, he had gotten a message too after they uh, killed me that he was next. And uh, Gerald started carrying a 38, and that scared us more than the criminals. Because <laughs> Gerald shouldn't be carrying a 38, and we laughed about that when I talked to him when the book came out. And uh, so we had a standoff that day, and, um, uh, it, uh, and then, uh, of course, um, uh, we were. One of the big events in our life, in many ways, good and bad, <clears throat> we, uh, in 1976, in November, we, had, we were doing a heroin deal in Columbus, and uh, uh, we, were, uh, we were ambushed. Uh, by, we, were, we began to arrest their Confederates in the midst of a, a by-bust, as we called it, and uh, we didn't know they had a sniper on the railroad trestle behind a clump of trees with a high-powered rifle, and he began to open fire on us, and uh, it was terrible gun battle ensued, and that's fictionalized in the book, too. But I will tell you on that part, uh, when you read that, that about that and everything that leads up to it and everything, that it, you will know this, that that is exactly how it happened. And, uh, and everything in there is exactly how it happened, and, and in addition to especially the uh, dramatic intervention of God that day, which uh, saved lives, even though people were wounded and everything. So, and throughout this book, you know, Michael, Michael's a cop philosopher and he, he comments on the world in which he travels. Uh, John D. McDonald, for those of y'all who remember him, one of my favorite writers and somebody that the current big names in writing just idolize and they should because he was a great writer. And uh, Travis McGee, he did in that series and some other things. Uh, uh, Travis was an uh, investigator, salvage expert, they called him a uh, philosopher, and, and he commented on the world in which he traveled to. And, and I wanted to do that, and so far people seem to like it. Uh, you have, it's a fine line to walk because you don't want to get uh, preachy or, or too heavy-handed with it and where it detracts from the story. But uh, hopefully we haven't done that. We just gave people a sense of the times. And Allison Weiner, Hope Weiner, who interviewed me in Beverly Hills uh, on that TV show, uh, was very kind. Uh, she loves the book and said it was evocative of some of the great Southern writers. And, and I'm not sure about that. I, I, don't, I don't know what she'd been drinking that day. But, <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. But it sure is, it sure is nice to hear those kind of words about something you've written and I'll tell you all truthfully I said you know you you when you write something uh, especially your first novel and uh, you know you, you get all these wonderful notes thoughtful notes some private some public and you see these reviews and everything and uh, people come up to you and tell you tell you how much the book meant to them and there's still that part of that part of you that little boy down deep down inside of you goes really you sure this is my book you read <laughs> And uh, but we're so uh, we've been so blessed and uh, just can't wait to get on into into the second book and uh, just uh, just see see how that goes and see what happens in Hollywood. We sure want to we sure want to bring uh, um, something good home for, for Mississippi a movie or a TV series. And we're leaning toward a TV series pitch uh, because there's, we have the, we would have more control there. Uh, big movie, the big, big movie makers are notorious for taking books and uh, slaughtering them. And they warned me, they said, we know that Michael was personal to you. And they said, uh, they make him, they may make him into somebody you don't like very much. And, uh, but we'll have more control. So we've already been developing a name 
for the TV series that we would pitch a pilot for, and um, and also on the way back. And of course, Mr. Reed, I'm going to insist that uh, the scene where he buys his suit at Reed's remain in. Don't worry, I got you covered. <laughs> And uh, so on the way back from uh, Hollywood, uh, uh, we got a message from a independent filmmaker on the other side of the country and said, I got your book. I know you're in Hollywood. I wish you well. That's where the big bucks are and, uh, and the big dis distribution channels and so forth. But, uh, but if it falls through, and I hope it doesn't, I'll commit to you right now. I will make Ghostly into a movie and I'll give you a sequel. So we've got that, that promise from her, and she's a nice lady, and uh, I've been looking at some of her work, and uh, so it, might it may work out uh, that way. Who knows? But I, feel like the, I still feel like that eventually there's a really good chance that Ghostly is going to find an expression in film uh, somewhere by somebody. It's just a matter of who and where and, and how. And, and they asked me, so, well, we've got to decide, you know, if they buy it, we've got to decide uh, where we want to... Uh, set this uh, series, you know, and I said, well, Mississippi, of course, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, you know, already you start seeing where they're saying, well, for ratings and demographics, you know, we might want to set it here, set it there, and I said, no, no, and uh, people told me before I went to Hollywood, they said, don't let uh, Hollywood get to your head, and I said, oh, I'm telling you, my age, I said, there's not enough gold in Hollywood uh, to turn my head, and uh, so, I can safely say that if somebody came to us and wanted to make something they said was the grandest and biggest thing that there was ever going to be, but they said, we're going to have Michael doing this and this and this, and we're going to change his personality to this, I, I promise you now that I'm strong enough in my faith to say, no, I'm sorry. You know, I appreciate it, but I said, no, that's, that's not what I want. <laughs> And uh, so, so we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. But Judy and I are having the time of our lives. And uh, we're, uh, somebody uh, on Facebook said, uh, guys, they said, you're so busy, you must be worn out. And I am, I am really tired. And I said, well, I said, I know what you mean. And I said, we're signing so many places. I said, I was leaving today. And I said, I met myself coming back in. <laughs> and that's kind of how it's been. And I have to ask her, if Judy, where are we today? You know, and uh, and everything, but it's been uh, it's been uh, quite uh, uh, quite the thing, and uh, everything. It's one of those things that everything that could go right has gone right, and I tell young people that I encounter everywhere, which is a joy. They want to be writers or, or just making their way in life, trying to decide what they're going to do. When I did a the Daily Mississippian at Ole Miss had a profile of us yesterday, and. I really love interviewing with a young lady there, and uh, she's an aspiring writer. And and uh, I told him, don't. I said, you'll encounter all kind of people in your life, you know, who will uh, tell you every reason in the world why you can't do something, you know. And uh, they'll rain on your parade, and and they live in a little box and their own little paradigm, and they don't like anybody. Uh, they don't get outside of it, and they don't want you to either. And uh, and I said, everything that people have told me about Ghostly. That couldn't happen, won't happen, absolutely cannot happen. Uh, it's all happened, and so uh, I said, I just encourage you, you know, to uh, you know to believe in what you do, and uh, and don't let the naysayers uh, drag you down. Um, so um, uh, I was thinking about reading a little bit. Anybody got any questions? Uh, I've rambled on here a bit. Anybody got some great questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if the enemies have read the book. Shady characters. Oh, yeah, this is a board down here. If y'all want to look, some of the uh, uh, people we made pictures with on a set of Criminal Minds and uh, Major Crimes and so forth. Uh, but, uh, yeah, my publisher asked me early on, she said, is, no, no one's going to show up and try to punch us in the face, are they? And I said, no. I said, I think most of the people who would, who might recognize a character they think is based on them, I said, uh, Either by natural or unnatural causes, Mr. Reed, they're no longer with us. <laughs> and uh, and I said, now I have met people who, um, uh, Alan Nunley uh, uh, emailed me the other day and said he'd finished it on the way back on the plane back to Washington. He said, I think I know who such and such is. He said, we must talk. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. 
And, uh, and uh, another uh, prominent person here in Tupelo, who I, I won't name, uh, uh, sent me a, a private message on Facebook and said, the lawyer uh, in Chapter 1, uh, I think I know who it is, and, uh, and she was right, too. And uh, so, uh, so everybody is, is asking me that and everything. The other thing they ask me is, uh, can they have a part in a movie? <laughs> And uh, two radio hosts out of Michigan I was interviewing with, they kept on, they kept on, and said, we've, we've got to have cameos if this becomes a movie and, and everything. They kept on, and I said, well, I said, that's a bit premature, but I said, you know, after thinking about it, I said, I do have, there are a couple of roles that I think y'all would be good for, because they told me, they said, we'd make great drug dealers. And I uh, said, so you can't see us, but we would. And I said, well, I, I think we have a couple of roles for y'all. And I said, but uh, unfortunately, they get brutally murdered early on. And I said, that's the story of our radio career. We get murdered all the time. We die every day on the air. And so we've done radio interviews everywhere from Anchorage, Alaska to Orlando and uh, all points in between. And uh, uh, was on uh, uh, with uh, George Klein uh, on Elvis Sirius Radio the day went worldwide. And... Uh, a guy in Virginia wrote me and uh, said, I heard you on with George. And he said, your book's great. I can't wait for number two. And so, you know, you just keep hitting all these outlets and uh, hoping that you have to work real hard because there's over 800,000 books that come out every year. Uh, some of them are not very good, probably, uh, but uh, still there's just a lot of noise out there. And if you're going ra- to rise above the den of all of that, you know, you have to be willing to get out and to work and to hustle. And um, after I left the bureau, I went into corporate America, and uh, and I, I got to be in charge of public relations and marketing in one area for a long time. And I learned a whole lot there about what works and what doesn't, and and everything. And social media was a bit after my time, as it came to be now, what we see now. And so I had to catch up in a hurry on that. And I can tell you that Facebook and things like that, LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, those are powerful marketing tools for an author. Uh, Facebook itself probably has been the greatest um, asset we've had uh, to actually turn people out for book signings. And, uh, and people have been so good and they're so interested. And we post a lot of pictures, take pictures everywhere we go and try to do interesting posts there. And, uh, and uh, so people have been very generous on Facebook. They tell all their friends, and some of them tell their friends, where none of these may be in your, your circle of friends on Facebook. And so it can really be quite the powerful tool. And uh, um, so we talk to people you know, all over the world. Just got a review from a lady through Facebook in Belgium, my first European review, recommending it to all of her European friends and everything. So, uh, you know, we we just signed the first book and when it went to Japan, just signed the first one that I know of that went to England, a signed book. Uh, and uh, one in Sweden and Switzerland or Denmark. I don't know, we're, we're beginning to to see it beginning to move and the word of mouth is beginning to carry it because generally people like the book and so they're telling people, their friends and family, to buy it. And generally what we see too is from what we get uh, back to us in notes, we figure that every copy, uh, and these are hardback first editions that everybody likes to collect, that every one of those copies is read, we think, by an average of six people based on the notes we get back. So they're passing it to friends and family and everything and uh, uh, so that's just a humbling humbling thing you know because this is much more than a book uh, just a a novel I tell people it's not your usual you know crime who done it with a plot you've read a thousand times before and you know exactly what's going to happen it's very predictable that's not this book they they try to pin me down on these shows and they say well tell us another book out there that it's like I said I don't mean to be arrogant I said, I just don't know of any. I said, this is a book that could have been written maybe 50, 60 years ago. It has no profanity in it, even though this is a very gritty story. There's not one word of profanity in this book. And I made that decision to stick with that. And I said, I wanted to write. I told people I wanted to write a book that if my mother and my English teacher, Ms. L.B. Johnson, were still alive, I wouldn't be ashamed for them to see it. 
and I've stuck to that. And some authors have argued with me in forums and said, oh, it'll be authentic. You know, you have to use these words and, you know, and so forth and so on. And one of them said, well, I just edited a big crime drama. And to be authentic, you have to do it. I said, I just wrote a big crime drama and Criminal Minds endorsed it. You know, I said, I said, if you're a good writer, we have plenty of descriptors at our command. You know, we don't have to do that. And I said, you use and overuse and misuse all of these words so much they don't have any power anymore anyway. You just assault people with them, you know, page after page, you know, gratuitous, gratuitous and titillating sometimes. Uh, that's why you do it. And I said, uh, I, I encouraged them. I said, I'm not judging you. I said, you know, you do what you feel like you need to do. But I said, that's just not for me. And I said, everything we write today, you know, you know, it's like epitaphs on our tombstone. I said, perhaps you want to be remembered for that. I, I don't want to. And so we stuck to that. And uh, uh, so, uh, one person tried to get us to put neon in it, as they call it. And I asked him, how do you define neon? They sent a sample of my writing back with profanity, just peppered through all throughout my writing. And I said, no. And then they said, well, uh, they're so formula driven and so afraid in today's world because old, big old houses were getting competition from Amazon and other on online people. And they said, well, could you add some vampires to it? They said, vampires are hot. <laughs> vampires are hot right now. I said, no. I said, well, no, we saw a lot of, we saw a lot of bad guys, you know, back then, but I don't, I don't know that any were actually vampires. And then they said, you know, and uh, they said, well, maybe too, you know, you shouldn't mention God in your book. Maybe it'll offend somebody. I said, let me see if I get this straight. Profanity in, vampires in, but God out? And I said, I don't think so. And so, as fate would have it, I was looking and looking, and then through LinkedIn one day, I found that Bethel Road Publications was, I saw them, and they were right here. I had no clue that a small Christian publisher was here in Tupelo. And so I contacted them. Uh, they looked at it. They read it. Uh, it was a big departure from them because it's not your safe Christian book, not your traditional safe Christian book, but undeniably a Christian message in the book. And uh, uh, so they took a chance, gave us a beautiful book. And as I told KKLA, you know, for a book like this, I said, my goal all along was to write a book uh, that was so entertaining and had so much truth in it and was so good, hopefully, that the secular world just could not ignore it. And so far, that plan is just right on track. And a lot of people who are not Christians who read the book and they like it because they like the writing, they like the story and the descriptions, and they feel like they're right there at the scenes and so visual, they say. And, and so, so far, you know, uh, that's all right on track. And so, but it's, uh, I'm helping other authors now trying to, when I get a chance about, you know, what they'll be asked to do and what works and what doesn't work and, uh, and everything. So it's been uh, quite a journey. And at 65 years old, I'm still like a sponge uh, just want to soak up everything I can learn that I don't know. I have an insatiable curiosity. I love to read and uh, I like to take uh, my own experiences and plus uh, the flavor of the times and comments by writers who have a real gift for history and um, for painting on big landscapes and, and incorporate some of, uh, of that into to my storytelling. And uh, so it's just a privilege and an honor and uh, that here at 65 and retired, uh, you know, I'm getting to do what I absolutely love to do. And writing a book, a novel is hard. I, I wrote many things in my life, you know, political speeches for a lot of candidates, uh, op-ed pieces, technical papers when I was in the corporate world and so forth and so on. But uh, writing a novel is an entirely different thing. It's pretty hard. And... Uh, uh, so, you know, I had to learn the craft as I wrote this first book to speaking other voices, other tenses. And Ghostly is a big, complex book. It has a lot of threads in it. You know, it's a big crime uh, drama for sure, but it's also an essential love story in it. Our best reviews are from women. Women love this book. We just get the greatest reviews from women. And, uh, and uh, one man search for gods in it. Of course, there's the Elvis thread in it. There's geopolitical intrigue in it and corruption of, 
uh, of government. Uh, it's just uh, uh, so much in it. And to, to take all of those characters at the beginning and arrive at the end with all the threads coming together and make sure at the end that you've got the relationships right, the names, the nicknames, the associations, and what the character would have said 300 pages ago to make sure he would still say something later that would be true to who that character was. It's a, it's, it's a daunting task and something you had to go back and look at many times. And I'll tell you all, when I first got through maybe the first, maybe the first big, big first draft, um, I hated it. I was convinced it was the worst thing anybody had ever written. And you just get kind of sick of it because you've edited it and edited it and rewrote it so many times. You know, you just kind of get where you can't see it anymore. And, uh, and, but I walked away from it, and uh, I came back, and uh, the Lord showed me, you know, what was missing. And I started from page one through the end, and I began to add descriptors and more descriptors and more descriptors. And when I did, all the characters began to come to life and just pop up off the page. They began to live, to breathe, and you began to see what they saw and felt what they felt, and you were at that place with them. And I tell people in interviews, I said, I, from the feedback I get, uh, some people seem to travel on this journey with Michael as he is searching and searching and seeking. And uh, uh, they get very, uh, uh, he, he gets very personal to them. They get wedded to him. And when they round a bend with him, sometimes uh, they bump into themselves and uh, from long ago. And they see something that he experiences, something he feels. And they say, I didn't know anybody ever felt that way but me. And sometimes they go on a journey to uh, to a place they've never been, but when they arrive, uh, the stranger, the people there are not strangers uh, to them when they arrive. And so it's just uh, it's just been uh, it's just been uh, quite the journey for us. And uh, if I can, if I got time to read a little bit. Sure. And uh, so I don't know how many of y'all. I know several of y'all already have the book and everything. So. Uh, 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 but uh, I'll read a little bit for y'all who haven't. How many How many do not have the book in here? Oh, how can, oh this can't be. <laughs> I'm glad I came here. <laughs> Merle, there's a great parallel with the way John Grisham got started, the way you are at this point, the great similarity. He's much better than uh, uh, Excuse me, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> it was so good, I wanted to hear it again. <laughs> Well, actually, somebody uh, somebody wrote on Amazon in a review, uh, said early Grisham good, the next John Grisham. Of course, I had to pay him a lot of money to get him to say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, somebody uh, who who, uh, uh, who was there with John in the early days came to our, our signing at Gumtree and told me some behind-the-scenes stories and at one time about how tough it was. He couldn't give away, real literally, couldn't give away a time to kill. And uh, how they were all going uh, down to Jackson, and he said uh, they uh, uh, decided they, they needed to stop and get some liquid refreshment. And uh, he said, we didn't have any room for it. He said, Merle, we backed up to the dumpster and started throwing out first editions of A Time to Kill in the dumpster. <laughs> I said, oh, it hurts me to hear that. I said, but I love those behind the scenes stories. Okay, this is chapter one, and, uh, and uh, it talks about Reggie Morris, uh, this, uh, this lawyer in the book, and uh, there was a character that I knew who was, he was based on, and, uh, and uh, uh, he was, he was a character. Uh, I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid, T.S. Eliot. Reginald Reggie Morris stared into a dark night made white by large flakes of snow falling in crystal sheets. He thought briefly that it looked like one of the small globes he had as a child, the kind you could turn upside down and shake until the little alpine village was blanketed with the deepest of snows. Something in the night suddenly screamed in its misery, and then it was quiet. There was only the song of the flakes against the glass. 
Reggie shivered and turned away, carelessly swirling the inch of amber liquid in the snifter. Some New Year's Eve, he thought. This abhorrent weather front had ruined his plans for another of the big parties for which he was famous. He had not even covered his lighted pool and now strained to see through the thick blizzard obscuring his vision. Looks more like Maine than Mississippi out there, he muttered to himself. Many years a pool would have been fine for a Christmas or New Year's gala. His remote lodge was nestled high atop a rise, far from prying eyes, in the deep forest of the Tombibby River Valley near Columbus, Mississippi. Some nights Reggie could still hear the almost feminine shrieks of southern panthers that roamed the area as they passed through their large territory, marking their presence with unsettling screams. Perhaps one lurked out there in the cold at that very moment, Reggie considered. They always unnerved him. He smiled grimly, should be celebrating, he thought. His man had won the Mississippi governor's race, and Reggie had cleared over $1.8 million in 1976. At least that was just what he would report to the IRS. No need to burden them with a cash transaction that he laundered through other business ventures outside his law practice. Reggie lived for the here and now. He brushed a lock of his golden hair from his eyes, hair that matched his delicate, almost feminine features. He pondered the events of the past week. All had not gone well for Reggie a middle-aged man who frequently danced with his demons. Why was he not content to make money legally like ordinary people? Reggie shook his head and looked blankly into the swirling snow. Snowflakes were orderly things that behaved in predictable ways, unlike his business. There were some transactions that had been disrupted recently, and he had unsavory people who held him accountable for their merchandise, merchandise that looked much like the fine white powder now building up against the cold sliding glass doors. The incessant ringing of the phone extricated Reggie from his thoughts. Hello, he said absently. Reggie, this is Howard, the Tupelo police detective grumbled in a deep voice. Why are you calling me at home on a night like this, you dumb hick? Reggie asked as he took another swig of brandy. Reggie, the DA's got me boxed in. I'm stuck and can't move. I'm afraid that our bribe to get him to drop the coke case on your clients won't work. He's got pressure from the state narcs. I can't stop worrying about it, so I called you to share the pain. You should know better than to bring up things like that on the phone. Get another beer from the fridge, watch Dick Clark ring in a new year, and quit bothering me. Good night, Reggie said as he abruptly hung up. Out in the whiteness of the storm, a man pale enough to pass through such weather almost undetected watched Reggie's house from a stand of cedar trees just beyond the pool house. He could see Reggie staring into the night, talking on the phone, feeling so safe and secure. He observed Reggie much as the lowland panthers watch a rabbit in the snow. That night, Reggie was also on the low end of the food chain, and the predator who stalked to him was one of those unsavory people who settled his debt suddenly and violently. The man rubbed the word legion on his pale arm, for his demons were many. Though safe from the unseasonable storm that raged outside, Reggie felt ill at ease, and knew that he had to make things right or there could be serious repercussions. Some of the people for whom he did favors were criminals, but could be reasoned with. Others, there would be revolutionaries. He squared around the left-leaning tea parties or borderline psychopaths. Ordinary people saw only the usual pitch for utopia and the standard, standard bashing of America. They cheerfully applauded the academic and hypothetical nature of the sermon. Reggie thought if they could see these guys for who they really were, it would terrify them beyond their worst nightmares. For some reason, Reggie was scared tonight, and the brandy wasn't reassuring him. The more he drank and the harder he peered in the growing whiteness looking for God knows what, the fuzzier everything became. He felt very alone. Only Peaches, his beloved poodle, barking at his feet, provided comfort. Peaches wanted to go out. Reggie cracked open an opening in the sliding glass door and admonished Peaches, hurry back, baby, don't freeze now. Peaches dashed to his favorite spot behind the pool house, sheltered by a thicket of azaleas. Reggie th threw another log on the fire and walked back to watch for Peaches, who normally did his business quickly and returned to the house. Reggie waited, and Peaches didn't return. He finally cracked the door a bit and called, Here, Peaches, come here, boy. But there was no sign of him, only the wail of the storm, like some disembodied spirit. Here, boy, come here, Peaches, come to Daddy. Reggie repeated louder and louder. His voice got higher each time, and despite the cold wind, little beads of sweat formed on his upper lip. 
The snow came down harder, seemingly in response to his cries. He could barely see the pool house. Reggie knew he would have to go in search of his little dog, but his heart was beating fast and hard. The brandy gave him enough courage to take down his overcoat and open the door against the swirling wind. Peaches, Peaches, where are you, boy? Reggie shouted in the loudest voice he could muster. His thoughts turned to the tiny pistol that he had left in the kitchen. He had never been comfortable with guns, but in a burst of sudden insecurity and vulnerability, he wished he had it with him now. The wind mussed his normally carefully quaffed hair, and flakes of snow stung his eyes, making visibility almost impossible. However, as he neared the pool house corner, there was no mistaking the growing red stain that marred the purity of the snow near the edge of the pool house. Feeling ill, he fell to his knees beside the butchered body of his precious peaches, lying dead in the shadows of the bushes that his devoted pet had dutifully watered. Angry and heartbroken, terrified, Reggie turned and hurled himself in a lurching run for the house. The wind and the snow tore at him as he ran for his life. The tree limbs reached down for him like long arms in the blowing wind. And just as a rabbit thinks he has, has it made, Sharp claws of the predator reach out of the darkness and deny him safe haven. And so it was once again. A pale man covered in snow stepped out from behind a tree beside the house and grabbed Reggie from behind with arms both real and strong. Reggie's scream was cut short. The monster that waited in the night spun him around and pressed a stiletto against his throat. Reggie's eyes went wild when he saw who it was, Frederick. Startled snowbirds fluttered from the shelter of their roof Roost fleeing this madness of man. The snow-covered albino stared down at him through dead red eyes, so red they appeared to bleed. Where's my money, Reggie? He demanded over the howling wind. I didn't know that the state narcs were going to screw it up, Freddy. How could I have known? Reggie pleaded. That's what you get paid for. I'm on the move and need my money tonight. The abominable snowman screamed over the roar of the storm. And that's where I'll stop. <laughs> And everybody usually goes, oh, but uh, for those of you who hadn't read it, I'll, I'll let you wait and see, uh, you know, what happens to Reggie. But uh, the real Reggie uh, that I, well, I based this on, uh, he, uh, he did dance with his demons. And uh, when I was promoted in the Bureau and got some semblance of power and authority, uh, he moved right up to invite me uh, out to his house out there uh, outside of Columbus to his famous uh, barbecued quail parties at the pool parties he would have, and uh, he would uh, get you out there and, and compromise you. He'd find out whatever your weakness was, and I mean whatever it was, and he would provide it to you to corrupt you and bring you into the fold. And because they uh, they they protected uh, all manner of criminal activity, and. Um, and everything, but we already knew, and I already knew who he was from our intelligence files, and uh, so I stayed far, far away from him. And uh, it's amazing when you got a little bit of power in those days in law enforcement, how many people suddenly wanted to be your friend and, uh, and tell you they, they, they felt bad for you because you weren't compensated any, any more than, than you were by the state, and it was just they could give you this and they could give you that and everything, and uh, so you constantly had to be on guard because they were always trying to uh, uh, soften you up a little bit here and there, and uh, I saw people who didn't didn't resist it and weren't careful, and they said, well, they'd rationalize it, and they said, well, you know, free this or free that. It's, it's not going to hurt, and the next thing you know, they woke up one morning and they didn't know who they were anymore. And so we had to constantly be on guard in those days. People who should have been our friends, some who wore badges, some who held political office were in fact our worst enemies. And they would compromise us, uh, they would put us in jeopardy for our safety uh, because they had lost themselves and they had totally sold their soul. And uh, so it was, that's all captured in the book too, uh, hopefully. So. I really enjoyed being here with y'all. If you don't have any questions, uh, any more questions, I'll say uh, goodbye. And uh, if y'all uh, happen to want a, a good book, as Mr. Reed has attested to right here in front of you. Judy, did you get that on tape? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So you really did get uh, captured and go through that horrific thing that you described in the book? Yeah, I did. Yeah.
Yeah, I did that. We were ambushed. Uh, met the killers hired to kill me, and uh, all of that was, uh, you know, was uh, based on things that really that really happened. And just uh, only by the grace of God uh, am I here. And and uh, you know, we were young, thought we'd live forever. We were invulnerable, and you know, uh, even Clemente was talking in Hollywood about. It. He said, he said the things he did. He said he totally shouldn't have done, you know, uh, you know and everything. And uh, he wandered into all these things and and wandered right out of them. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us anything about the title? Why the title? Why did they name it the title? Well, uh, er, a lot of people ask me that, particularly music aficionados. And uh, uh, the uh, central villain, uh, Frederick, uh, the way I had cast him as somebody who's suffering from albinism, a ghostly white. And plus, I like a whiter shade of pale, but Proko Haram always have. It's a classic song. And so I kind of took a whiter shade of pale and made it a ghostly shade of pale. And when I was on uh, the big radio station in Orlando, the bumper music they set up to lead in was a whiter shade of pale. And I told them that was very appropriate. And a lot of people ask me about that who know that old song. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, the, the temples are all gone now. I tell everybody I've come home to fly the flag uh, again. But uh, Davis, uh, TKE's, uh, the inventor of the famous potato salad that I tell everybody was so good that it put Little Day through a Ph.D. in chemistry at Ole Miss. Uh, he was my uncle. And Uncle Milton at the Bank of Mississippi uh, was my uncle. And my daddy was Merle. He worked at Rockwell. My mother was Lillian, retired from the hospital. Uncle Ed... Uh, was at Borden's uh, for all those years. I saw his son, uh, Pastor Ed, Edwin Marshall, a temple from, uh, to, from Batesville. He's over in Batesville now. He was at Nettleton for a while as a pastor um, and uh, was uh, back in his old Miss days, was the pastor at the Wesley House. Uh, so uh, they're all gone now, but uh, like I said, I've come home at Tupelo and uh, glad to be here. But uh, I'll tell you uh, one quick story. In 1966, I graduated from Nettleton High School, and Judy did as well. And we rode the same little school bus back in those days, and we were all friends. And in 1969, when I was working my way through college, doing every job, awful job known to mankind, which convinced me more and more that I needed a college degree, uh, I wandered into TKAs to get some of that good potato salad and barbecue plate that everybody loved and to see Uncle Dave. And when I came in, I saw Judy having lunch that summer. I went over to say hi to Judy, and she was having lunch with Susan Jackson, uh, Felix Jackson's daughter. Well, I asked Susan out, and we were married three months later. <laughs> and uh, her and uh, Judy were great friends. We were working together that summer, and they were just great friends. Judy, uh, <laughs> Susan's loved Judy. And so uh, a few months later, uh, we were living in a, a drafty old duplex at Miss Coggins from Nettleton on up on North Church Street, uh, kind of near Robbins Field. And uh, uh, Judy calls, and I was commuting for my last year at Ole Miss with Lex Jackson, you know, my friend who's in your family now. And, uh, uh, and so Judy called and said her and Jerry Bates they were going to run off to the Justice of Peace in Verona and get married, but we'd go with them. So the four of us loaded up, and I was photographer and best man. And so Jerry and Susan passed away in 2007, and Lord let us back together, and we got married. So I tell everybody now, I said, I've been both of Judy's weddings. I was best man and bestest man. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for queuing up that memory from TKE. Thank you all.